Um, again, my name is Jason Morgan. I'm the managing principal of the Common Pool. We have teams in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Chicago, Washington, D.C., and Seattle, all developing prizes and developing prizes around the world. We're working with the First Minister of Scotland on the Saltier Prize. We've worked in Mazdar City in Abu Dhabi. Um, we're building prizes for the federal government now, and we have private commercial and philanthropic interests that are more and more gaining kind of uh, interest in this model, and we feel like we're kind of at the front of that. So unfortunately, what I'd like to say that you know, not all of the kind of research that has been developed around prizes and how incentive systems work is tracking close to kind of what's currently happening. There's been kind of this recent resurgence in the use of these models. And so we're very much comfortable speaking with Rand and speaking with others about how we can kind of push the field a little further. So a lot of people can take the research and our track record and our experience in designing these incentive systems and turn them into credible you know, academic literature. Um, in 2007, I was the head of the XPRIZE Foundation's prize development department. And we were preparing to announce at the Clinton Global Initiative that we had $300 million in prize purses in the pipeline. And it started to dawn on us that we really didn't have a model that was really scalable, that each of these prizes was kind of hand wrought and we were going about each one in a very customized way. And we wanted to kind of increase the pool of those who were kind of either learning what we were doing or had a different approach to what we were doing. So we went to MIT, and we were actually involved with the MIT and the Harvard MIT Health Sciences and Technology Group. And we set up a lab. Dr. Erica Wagner and I uh, founded the lab. It was at the Sloan School of Management at MIT, and we started to teach a class. And um, the first thing we did when we kind of designed how this lab would work is we agreed that we really needed to go back and do some research on the early history of prizes. And you heard Sid talk about kind of how intellectual property rights and patent law has kind of tracked back pretty far in history. And you'll see that the use of prizes and challenges and rewards and bounties and premiums and all these names that kind of equal what I'm calling a prize dates back to the 1500s. And yet, as these intellectual property rights started to instantiate, prizes kind of had this interesting story, this narrative that kind of goes alongside of that history. So I want to begin the first slide talking about a telling a story. Um, and the story of prizes, in my opinion, is the early beginnings of kind of open innovation and free market exchange. Uh, there was a time, which we're all aware of, that there was no such thing as a patent, right? Or where there were patents, they were given out indiscriminately or they were hard to enforce. And so much of kind of the fundamental know-how, the technical knowledge for how you might build a ship or a cathedral was contained within uh, trade, trade guilds and merchant unions. And these were very closed networks, right? And so what you had was every now and then there would be some big challenge, some big problem. And because these networks were so closed, it was hard for them to mobilize and to come up with a quick answer. They basically would start bumping up against the limits of those people who were within these closed networks, and they realized that they weren't going to be able to solve this, these big problems. So. What's so fascinating about prizes is that at a time, say starting in kind of the mid to early 1500s, society was really structured around uh, this idea that class and standing really determined your access to capital, your access to resources. And what they would do is they would say, okay, it doesn't really matter. If, if, if there was a problem that was so pressing, either through war, famine, pestilence, that they had to solve the question quickly, is they would come out and they would offer a prize. And they would say, okay, we give up. It doesn't matter where you went to school, it doesn't matter who you know, if you can solve the problem, you win fame and fortune. And that was the whole notion behind prizes. It was really an effort to kind of open the innovation process and really kind of bring in new mind share and new investment. And, and since there was fundamentally this failure, this vacuum, it didn't take a lot of money to get new people to play around and to try to win these prizes. It was their one chance to kind of get out of their situation. And so, the history goes back, like I said, I've got a, I've got a timeline here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the British Longitude Prize. Kind of early in the history of prizes, there, there, there was this continuing problem of determining longitude on the high seas. It was stopping exploration, it was confusing trade routes, it was a very serious problem. So for about 200 years, they were looking to people like Galileo and they were trying to come up with astral charts and ways in which they could determine longitude. They could create a vector in which they would know where they were on any given point. Um, 
and they were not solving the problem. So the British put up a prize. And out of nowhere comes this clockmaker, William Harrison, who solves the problem. Uh, never would have been expected that a clock would have solved this problem. And so um, you, you have this early idea that kind of people are coming at this from a different angle. If you can find someone who is willing to take a chance, you can solve these problems, you can increase the pool, you can create more mind share, and you can get to a solution. Um, the next story I want to tell you is about the Alkali Prize. So I think it was in France, it was King Louis the Sixteenth who was paying exorbitant rates for alkali from Spain. This is how they created synthetic glass, paper, soap. And he was tired of paying this premium. And so he decided to put up a prize for the first person who could come up with a synthetic, a different process for synthesizing these staples and these goods. And the person that won it was Nicolas Leblanc, came out of nowhere, won this. This was followed by the Napoleonic Food Preservation Prize. Napoleon was tramping across Eastern Europe and his troops were dying in the field and he came back and he said, I cannot have this. I need someone to find a way to preserve food. And this Parisian candy maker comes out of nowhere. And he comes up with the solution. It's very similar to the solution that we use today. And what you see is that there are a lot of interesting stories. A lot of kind of our most important technological breakthrough, breakthroughs occur during this period. Okay? And, and, and there's funny stories about how you know, margarine was created as a prize. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the potato as a food source came out of a prize. A lot of interesting things. I, I welcome any of you to read the KEI research note that kind of lays out a whole index of prize breakthroughs. Um, then, as intellectual property started to instantiate, and as you started to have people competing in the marketplace because there was some intrinsic value attached to coming up with an idea, prizes started to shift slightly. And what they were is all of a sudden they were about how you could take an existing piece of technology and push it further, or prove that it was reliable, or effective, or safe, or inexpensive. And so one example of that is the Chicago Times Herald put up a prize. This was a race in which we were trying to prove that cars could work as well as horse-drawn carriages. Later, we had the Deutsche Prize, which was really a hot air balloon race around the Eiffel Tower. These are oftentimes prizes that are designed to get a lot of media attention, right, to try to focus the public imagination on the possibility of technology. And the most documented prizes out of this category is really the Ortigue Prize. So what we had was Raymond Ortigue was a wealthy hotel owner. He owned hotels in New York and Paris. And he wanted to create a prize where he would reward the first person to cross the Atlantic in a plane, right? So he puts up $25,000. Next thing, nine teams register, and they spend $400,000 to win the prize. And the most unlikely winner, Charles Lindbergh, who the New York Times called a flying fool, crosses from San Diego to the Midwest to New York, takes off, lands in Paris, and becomes the most famous person on the planet, right? And so this story, which is documented in the spirit of St. Louis, is, is, is really important because it became kind of this document, really, this documented effort, this, this way in which we could look back and we could see that this leverage had occurred. Because what we know is that right after Lindbergh's flight, the number of private pilots, pilots licenses that were applied for went up like 300x. The number of people that were investing in aviation, commercial aviation, went up like 400x. It was just phenomenal, the uptake of this industry. What he had really done is he had proven to the public that it could happen. And so this whole commercial aviation industry started to emerge out of this single feat. So you have, well, let me go back. You have this period in which it was about 50-year lull in which you don't see that many prizes. And today what we have is a tremendous amount of activity. Over the last decade, and I, I, I can show you a, a chart around, around this, we've seen this tremendous uptake um, to the point that we, McKenzie and, uh, and company did a report with us where we determined that the current size of the marketplace, or at least the size in 2009, was about $2 billion dollars with, with inc massive gains per year, and a lot of experimentation occurring online. But some people will attribute that to this prize. This is the Ansari X Prize. So Dr. Peter Diamandis, who is the CEO of the, Ansar of the X Prize Foundation, had read The Spirit of St. Louis, and he was very interested in kind of replicating the leverage that Ortig had achieved. So he, he, he went and he found a sponsor, the Ansari family, and he called the prize the Ansari X Prize because he didn't know 
quite what the X was going to mean. For a while, it took a long while to get the sponsor in place. It was just the X Prize, and it kind of stuck. And then when the Ansari family came along, what they provided was a $2.5 million hole-in-one insurance policy from Lloyd's of London. And it stated that $10 million would be paid out if a team could take a privately financed rocket, put it into outer space twice in two weeks, carrying the payload equivalent of three people with only touch labor and fuel costs on the second flight. You have 26 teams from seven different countries compete in the prize. They spend $100 million to win the $10 million. The $10 million is only paid after its success has been achieved. And you have three billion media impressions that occur both over the course of the prize and then in the years that followed it. But what's probably most important is that you had Virgin Galactic leases the winning technology from Mojave Aerospace Ventures, right? Investments in Virgin go on. So you have this, you have this multiplier effect, right? You have 2.5 million to 10 to 100 all the way up to 1.1 billion and more. What we know now is that there are states like New Mexico, Florida, that are investing in developing new launch pads that can be leased to private entities. So we think, what we think, although we don't know it yet, is that like Lindbergh, this would open up a new industry, right? This would open up new opportunities for people and that by participating in the prize, those who did get involved early on have this first mover advantage. So the real attraction of the prize, looking at it from the player's point of view, is not so much the one-time chance to win $10 million, right? It's that they have a company, they have an approach, they have a solution, and they want to commercialize that solution, and this is a way to bring some exposure to their approach. So in 2009, we worked with McKenzie on studying the size of this landscape and looking at prizes over the last 40 years. And you see this kind of steeply ascending curve this is really looking at just prizes that are $100,000 or more in purse size. And really, I'll tell you, the bias going into the study was that we're really looking at prizes like the XPRIZE Foundation's model, where it was kind of in inducements for bringing about new technology, a kind of a reward system in which it was focused on new breakthroughs. And out of the $2 billion valuation, we thought that that represented about $375 million of it. So it, probably the hard number in this valuation was the 375 million. What they didn't really account for was a lot of the online prizes that started to happen. A lot of the lighter weight versions of this, right? Business planning competitions, blueprint con contests, all these kind of, kind of things that were trying to mirror the, the X prize model, but really were coming in at a much lower price point. Um, the, uh, I already mentioned that the average growth of this is about 18, if you average this curve out from the last decade, this is about 18% a year. There's a lot of kind of success stories, a lot of cautionary tales here. This is good for my business because I consult and I build software around prizes. I can, and we'll walk through some of the examples of failures in this space. So who's spending this money, right? Well, this is a, this is a chart. This was, again, published in 2009. I think, I think what it shows you here is that the largest segment at that time was kind of the nonprofit sector, but those who were making the investments were by and large those who established these organizations after 1995. This is what we're calling new venture philanthropy. This is people who have made mo their money recently, who are still alive. These are people coming out of Silicon Valley. These are people who look at philanthropy and they say, I only want to pay for results, I don't want to give away grants, and I want to do it as efficiently as possible. And so there's a there was a huge amount of interest coming out of those groups. Um, and that's why you see this spike here. I would say, in terms of kind of the growth segment, if you look at these others, government now is kind of the fastest growing segment among those making these investments. In early 2010, I got a call from a guy named Tom Khalil, who uh, was out of Berkeley, and he was working at the White House OSTP, Office of Science and Technology Policy. And he was putting together a small team of people who he felt were experts in this field. And he was talking to them about how the administration could go about promoting this model instead of the use of grants and other forms of government spending. And so we spent, or those of us that were involved, spent the better part of a year helping kind of figure this out for them. And in early 2011, a law was signed in, a bill was signed into law, uh, the America Competes Act. And the America Competes Act kind of overrides a lot of conflicting legislation that prohibited certain agencies from running prize competitions. Now with this law, in place, what we're seeing is there's a lot, of, a lot of activity in the federal government. If you want to see more of that, I encourage you to go look at challenge.gov. 
And challenge.gov is effectively a uh, inventory, an index of all of the existing prizes in the federal government, and it's growing rapidly. We're involved with the Department of Commerce on building a prize. We come and we give lectures regularly uh, before other federal agencies about how the model works. And, and not only that, we're also seeing a huge uptake in these same models within the UK. We're advising the First Minister of Scotland on a big prize there. And I'll tell you this, because I know that Rand has a specific interest in the Middle East and the GCC. They're hugely popular there. We had the advantage of working at Mazdar City in Abu Dhabi on a Lifetime Achievement Award there. We're seeing the Qatar Foundation is sponsoring the WISE Prize. We're seeing a lot of activity in that region, MENA, Cairo, and the GCC. So I've taught, I keep using this word prize, and I, I, you know, I, I'm always kind of reluctant when I, when I use that word because it sounds a little bit like carnival barking, right? It's a little bit like kind of look at this bright, shiny thing over here, and there's a lot of people that talk about sweepstakes and reality TV, and they use the analogy of American Idol, and, and, and I think those things have credibility. I think there's value in those things, but when we first sat down with Tom Khalil's team, we all came up with our own way of kind of charting out what the landscape is. What are the key categories for these models, and how do they work differently? And this is my, my version of that exercise. So on the first axis, you have this these incentive rewards, right? These are, this is the ex-ante approach. This is where cash is only paid after the model has been proven versus those recognition awards, right, ex-post. The truth is, is that if you go and you look at other kind of uh, inventories of existing prizes, the vast majority of prizes exist right here. Now, we're all very familiar with them, right? The Academy Awards, the Nobel Prize, Pulitzer Prize, all of that. In the last, well, since 1991, we've seen a dramatic shift, right? And so while there's still a lot of activity and there's a lot of established prizes in this, in this ex post area, the shift is occurring dramatically, right? So you're seeing kind of 75% gain after 1991, 75% decrease after 1991. A lot more attention paid to the ex ante model. The intersecting axis is really about proofs of concepts versus concepts, ideation versus demonstration, right? And I want to walk through these four quadrants that we've just created and tell you a little bit about kind of what's happening now and what I think is important. So because a lot of the attention is being paid here, there's been a lot of experimentation, a lot of very bold experimentation. Um, I've listed four quick ones. Uh, one of them is a cl client of mine, actually, so I, I, in full disclosure, the Mickelson Prize and Grants is a $25 million reward for new breakthroughs in wet bench life sciences. It has to do with reproductive and sterilization uh, technologies. Um, the XPRIZE Foundation is continuing to publish prizes. They just uh, launched one with Qualcomm, which is the Tricorder Prize in Life Sciences. Richard Branson and Al Gore launched the Virgin Earth Challenge. This is a $25 million reward for removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. The Victory Project is a billion dollar reward with specific rules that you can see at the Dewey Foundation's website. Here's what's happening, or here's what's happened. There has been an arms race that has occurred in this little niche sec sector where the, where the early theory was that the larger the prize purse, the more attention that would be paid to you and the more quality uh, participation you could attract. That has proven to be untrue entirely. And what we know now is that the Victory Project, zero participation. They're offering a billion dollars. Richard Branson's a pretty smart marketeer, right? He's a pretty smart mar marketing guy. Zero participation. Mickelson and Grant's just kind of coming out of a slump. XPRIZE Foundation also suffering from the same problem. It's just not the case that the more money you offer, the more people play. With more options, with a growing marketplace, with a lot more prizes out there today, what people look for is they look for the value for those, for those who don't win. They want clear, open, transparent process. If there isn't a clearly uh, define finish line. If the participation process is not outlined clearly on the front of each website, people won't play. They just have other places to go. And this has become the kind of this distinguishing characteristics of prizes that work. Open, clear, fair, transparent process. And this is what we do. We focus on delivering those aspects for each of our clients. So in this other area, which was by and large ignored by the McKenzie report, we see a lot of activity. You know, I don't know if you guys, are, I would think similar to Rand, the Brookings Institute has been involved in this area. They have a, they have a, 
a prize every year on kind of ideation and white papers, right? And the purpose of that prize is really just to get graduate students to start submit white papers on policy. And th there, there is no effort to try and take those proposals and put them into law, right? It's just there in order to generate a discussion, in order to get the folks at Brookings talking about the potential of some of these ideas. So on the outer extreme, you have ideation for the sake of ideation, right? You have, you have prizes as a way to source new ideas, new approaches, just to kind of discuss them and to work through them. But what's happening is, because the attraction of kind of pay for performance, right, and leverage and everything that's been promised in this segment, you have a lot of these online prizes that are starting to inch really close up to this line. Right, what we're calling is reduction to practice, RTP. This is where you might have a business plan writing competition in which the winner is provided the funding to launch the company, right? This is where Hilton Hotels goes to some online prize platform and they say, you know what, we can either pay Bain or McKenzie a million dollars to price our honeymoon suites, or we can go to every MBA program in the country and say we'll offer you $25,000 in a job to come up with a model that works, right? And what happens? They get the full range of the approaches, they get to hire the team, take that team, take their proposal, put it into practice, apply the model, and see how it works. Hugely efficient way. People call this crowdsourcing, they call it open innovation, they call it a lot of things. But where there are compelling incentives, where you can calibrate those incentives properly, you get a tremendous amount of activity, you get a tremendous diversity of approaches, and this is now being applied in commercial segments as well as philanthropic sectors. You have a lot of people that are piling onto this. What, what has happened recently is you have a company like Threadless. Threadless is in the business of making t-shirts, right? And Threadless wants to sell a lot of t-shirts. And so the way that they do this is rather than designing their logos and making a bet on a particular t-shirt, they have a contest. And they say, we want all the UCLA graduates to come up with a great logo for the UCLA football t-shirt on Threadless, right? All of the UCLA alumni who love the and those that love the football team come to the site, they vote on it, and, and, and the winning t-shirt is then sold to that same consumer base. So, you, you know, you, you, while you also have a lot of people who are kind of playing in the space, you have a lot of people now that are realizing gains from applying this in a more kind of commercial way, right? Right, and so, and so, you know, I mean, the same thing can be said about American Idol. Well, what is American Idol, right? It's an effort to kind of sell records. It's an effort to get a consumer base for all those. It's this effort to leapfrog over this development process that has to occur in the music industry and to establish at the outset a, a base of people who are going to buy this music. I mean, this is, these commercial applications are starting to grow. They're starting to move in different ways. And I'll tell you, uh, I, I, the way that the common pool works is that we have partnership agreements with other major providers so that we don't have to make a particular bet on any one piece of software. We, we find people that are, we think are promising and we partner up with them. Probably the most interesting thing that's happening right now is that people are talking about kind of web 3.0, big data web, the big data internet, right? There's a company called Kaggle, and I recommend you go and you look, look them up. K-A-G-G-L-E, Kaggle.com. Kaggle is out of Australia and Silicon Valley now. They just closed their Series A. They raised $11 million from the Stanford Endowment, Vinod Khosla, Gil Elbaz. Very, very interesting investors. What Kaggle does is they go and they find data scientists and machine learning experts. And then they go to insurance companies, and they say AIG or American Express is another person that worked with. They say, you know, your predictive modeling really isn't working all that well, right? We think that we can do better. And if you release data on our site, we'll put up a prize. And they have 25,000 data scientists that actively participate in these prizes. And you would be amazed at the results. Basically, you know, the insurance company comes in and says, here's our predictive model for determining who is going to kind of get in a car wreck, right, if it's a progressive insurance or whomever. Uh, these data scientists, they come in, they barrage the data set, they build new models, new approaches. They do exponentially better than what the IRED team within any of these insurance companies could ever produce, right? I mean, this is the Joy's Law, the Bill Joy's Law, right? This is like the smartest people are not working for you, right? The smartest people are somewhere else. You just have to find them, right? That's how this works. This is what the whole premise of this is. And so if you think of Kaggle, right, we don't, let's not call it reduction of practice. Let's say... What does Kaggle deliver? They deliver an algorithm, right? Is an algorithm a proof or is it a concept? Is it a proof of concept? It falls squarely in the middle here, right? It's only a demonstration when the algorithm has been applied by the sponsor, then rolls over. Let's talk about kind of briefly what's below the fold, 
right? We've got all of these recognition awards. And what are they? Well, they are, you give money to some old guy, usually, right? He's already done what he's going to do. And he takes the money and he goes and buys himself a beach house and it's over. Uh, as we've gained more attention, kind of looking at this quadrant, a lot of these prizes are starting to try and mirror that effect, too. So, you know, the Zyde Future Energy Prize, which we, we designed in Mazda, I don't want to speak for other prizes, so I'm only going to kind of focus in this, in this subject on those where we've been involved. The Zyde Future Energy Prize was a Lifetime Achievement Award in clean tech. The Abu Dhabi government, the Crown Prince's Court, is building a city. They're putting $30 billion into building a zero-carbon footprint city in the desert. Where it, for those of you who've been to Qatar, you know it's like 135 degrees and 80% humidity in August, right? It's a brutal, brutal place. They're trying to experiment there. One of the problems that they have in the GCC and at Mazdar is this churn of talent. They can't get smart people to go there and stay there. They just don't want to be there, right? They also are bumping up against the limits of known technology. You know, PV is only going to give you so much. Concentrated solar power is only going to give you so much. There's only so much they can do in for order to deliver this promise of this city that's entirely sustainable. And so when, when I went there and I sat down um, with the CEO, I said to him, I'm very excited about this. We're going to build prizes that are going to bring forward new technologies. We're going to do all these great things. He looked at me and said, no, Jason, what we're going to do is a Lifetime Achievement Award. And I just deflated. I was like, oh, this is not worth your time or money. And what I learned is that he was actually smart to do this because what we were doing with the Zyde Future Energy Prize is we were creating a process in which those that applied were having a very positive experience. It really was about trying to nominate and create a community of people that were going to get involved in this project and that were going to stay involved with this project. And by using this Lifetime Achievement Award, both to find kind of like these postdocs who are all over the world who are really interested in this subject matter and these other people who had achieved great things, we could then tap into them to do other things. We could then use these networks. We could then find them when we wanted to deliver the zero carbon footprint plug-in air conditioning unit for the villa in Mazdar City. When you wanted to find an energy storage solution, Yet Ming Cheng at MIT, ABC123, he's the guy. We knew that because of this. We find him. We not only find him, we find all the postdocs that he's nominated for this, and we can source talent to get to your point, Lindsay. Um, these are kind of the seven ways, as we see it, that prizes can deliver change. May not be, it may not include everything, but this is pretty close. Well, I'm going to kind of talk about five of them. Um, I'm going to stay away from kind of influence, public perception. These are really kind of media ploys, and they're, they're, they're very interesting. Uh, and the idea of mobilizing capital, kind of solving for the venture capitalists and the private equity guys ways to source good deal flow. These are all on the table, but I, I, we can talk about them over lunch, or I'll take questions at later. But um, this is a kind of a series of slides that I've built that talk about our more idealized version of how our prize might operate and why. And so I'm going to walk you through these pretty quickly, and then we can, we can talk about a few other as aspects of our approach. The truth is, is that, as I mentioned before, there's not that much real research that substantiates this. Most of what I'm talking about is based on our track record and our experience and what we think is fairly intuitive. But there have been a couple reports. I'll walk you through one of them. And then, I'll, and then I'll show you actually detailed information about some of the prizes that we've operated and how the participation process looks and, and how the dashboard approach to kind of determining their progress looks. So you've got mission and media. Um, since a lot of our prizes are focused on more kind of philanthropic intentions, or at least they are right now, um, the, thing about th th the thing about this is that when we look at what kind of prize to create, the first thing that we really look at is kind of whether there is a market failure there or not, right? I mean, because there's a lot of activity flowing into segments like biotech and pharmaceuticals, right? Do we really need a prize in order to move the needle in, in, in that respect? Kind of what's the vacuum? What is it that we're really solving for? And oftentimes, this is either the fact that there aren't enough people dedicated to the mission or the purpose of what you're trying to achieve, or there's not enough attention, right? There's asymmetry of information. There's, there's kind of certain other market failures that has to do with kind of regulatory environment. Um, but kind of the combination of mission and media and how that can kind of bring more attention to the topic and the drama that's kind of a part of these competitions, that helps kind of drive 
participation from both of these kind of groups. Um, the next thing we look at is how much cash do you have to put up, right? And we go through a fairly extensive exercise where we look at kind of what are the drivers for those people that we think can now already solve this problem, right? There, is an, there are many examples of people who have failed to do this and therefore they have failed to have a successful prize. Armin Hammer, very well-known philanthropist in Los Angeles in 1980 was dying of cancer. He put up a million dollars for the first person that could cure cancer. Nobody played, nothing happened. Was it, it takes like six years to get a compound through the FDA approval process and it cost about $1.5 billion, right? What's a million dollars gonna do? Nothing, right? This is the problem, is that when there's not enough attention to paid to the current drivers for kind of how you can attract new talent or attract different approaches or really compel people to take a risk and invest their own capital going after your prize, they tend to fail. The next idea is kind of the notion of kind of diversity of approach. And you, here you kind of have observers and players. And I kind of already said this, but really by, adding, by, by creating a prize in which you're creating an attraction for both those that are going to commit to their investing in the solution and those that are going to be interested in watching it, you're really kind of creating this first mover advantage for the people that kind of come out in the, as the top performers, right? So uh, in the case of Lindbergh, you know, and we're in the case of some of the other prizes I've mentioned, you have a whole industry that breaks open and they're kind of right at the bleeding edge of that, ready to capitalize on that. Then you have this idea of kind of experts and editors, right? You have this idea that because prizes sometimes sound like carnival barking and sweepstakes and game shows, really, you need to bring a lot of credibility at the outset of the launch, at the development of the prize. People want to see who's making the decision. And this becomes even more important because where the pedigree of your experts, the, your judges, goes up, participation goes up only if you can provide a certain amount of value for the people that are playing, only if they have access to them. So. When we engineer kind of the player experience, right, when we sit down with a client and they say, this is what we want to do, the first thing we tell them is we're not going to try and solve for what happens to the person that wins the prize. We're going to try and solve for what happens to the person that doesn't, right? And where there is even incremental value for those people, you see a tremendous uptake in activity. And there's two forms of value. We call it vertical value, the first one, and that's where you're providing feedback from those known experts to the player. And the second is the notion of kind of lateral value and where these people can start to connect to one another. So if at the end of this prize you have some rank order of performance, you've got 25, you, I finished 23rd out of 25, the ability for me to go and talk to who finished 25th or first really is, a, is, is, a, is, is very compelling right now. So feedback loops from experts, the ability to connect laterally to the other people that are playing or observing, these are what we look for when we design prizes. So, I said there isn't a lot of research around this, but there is a guy at Harvard Business School named Kareem Lakani who wrote a great paper, The Value of Openness in Scientific Problem Solving, out of HBS, and there were other authors. He, Kareem speaks about this paper quite a bit. He went to a group called Innocentive, and what Innocentive does is they came out of Eli Lilly, actually. Innocentive is an online company that has a platform for prizes. These are highly technical prizes. And they have a pool of about 200 to 250,000 people that actively participate in these contests. They're kind of like what I mentioned with Kaggle, right? They're very similar. They tend to focus on highly technical problems where there's sometimes more or less a subjective criteria for determining the winner. These can be new chemical compounds where you know, these models are presented. They test the compounds to see how commercially viable they are and they come up with a winner based on a judging process. So what Kareem did is he went through this database of all these people that were winning these prizes, and he said, wow, who are these people, right? Where are they coming from, and what do they care about? And he found some really neat stuff. So where you, where you see like a new chemical compound prize that is one that's been launched on the Innocentive platform, you have all these disciplines, right? All these people that represent these disciplines that are kind of attacking this, the problem simultaneously. And what he saw was that the winners were six degrees or more separated from the target discipline, okay? So if you, had a, if you had a challenge in toxicology, right, you might think, well, we need to get a bunch of biologists, we need to get a bunch of chemists, we need to get drug pathologists involved in solving this. And what happens is it's the guy who's studying fractal algorithms over here that comes up with the answer, or crystallography. This is where the answer's coming from, right? So what does this say? Well, it says a few things. Um, it says winners are technically or socially marginal to, no, to the problem set. You need intellectual diversity to win. I like this one where in science, women are more likely to win. We don't know why. Um, 
then, and, then, and then the fancy way of saying this is that, you know, where you have this uncertainty, multidimensional inputs, right? Prizes create the most change. Multidimensional inputs. And what it says for us, though, is it dispels two important fallacies. The first is this notion that you've got some guy tinkering in his garage or playing around, some dilettante who's going to fix the problem, right? It's like the goodwill hunting character we're all looking for, right? He doesn't exist, right? And so it, what, what you really have is you have these people who, the second point is that you have these people who are highly trained in their own disciplines that are applying these same kind of entrenched ways of solving problems only to a new problem set. And that becomes important when you start thinking about how you market your prize for quality participation, right? Putting an putting a, a, a ad on the front page of the New York Times isn't going to drive quality participation. That guy doesn't exist, right? What we're trying to do here is, w w when we, I talk about leverage, what we're, a, a lot of times these people, they think they're going to win. The short answer is they think they're going to win. Um, and this is like most things, right? Entrepreneurs always overestimate their chances of success, right? Scientists tend to take risks because they overestimate their chance that they're going to find the answer. So a lot of these people do think they're going to win. But, as I said before, a lot of them are kind of more compelled by the, the non-financial aspects as well. The ability to connect with the community, the ability to solve a big problem that's never been solved before, the ability to get feedback from experts, from people who are credible in their eyes. These are the non-financial drivers for people that are playing in these prizes. And we've learned that they're sometimes even more important than the financial ones. That's what we've learned as we've talked to them. Right? So imagine a situation in which I'm writing, I'm involved in the Stanford Business Plan competition. Right? And I'm probably going to go off and try to launch this company anyway, but I'm going to participate because if I'm going to get, you know, five, ten different experts that are going to review my plan and give me critical feedback on that, that has value. That's a strong motivating force. If I have the ability to go out and find other people that are also writing similar business plans and either merge with them or connect to them or have them give me feedback, that's a very compelling incentive. So these other non-financial awards are very important. Okay, so objective criteria. Um, with the objective criteria in the case of the X Prize, what we're trying to get to here is something elegant, simple, and smart. In the case of Ansari, it was it took a long time to calibrate the rules, but it was it was basically how can we inspire people to believe that privately financed space flight could occur, right? How could how could we prove that that was possible? Well, it's this balancing act. So how can you be audacious? but yet achievable. And this is a lot of what you'll hear if Peter Diamandis was up here. Audacity versus achievability. He set the 100 kilometer limit because 100 miles was just too much. And most of us don't know the difference between a kilometer and a mile. So, so why not lower the burden, right? <laughs> why not? You know, uh, the idea that uh, twice in two weeks, this is about reusability, right? This is about something that's commercially viable. The idea of, you know, the payload equivalent of three people, the idea of kind of only touch labor and fuel costs, this is all getting to reusability. It also eliminates the accountants and the lawyers, right? It also is just you either do it or not, and if we can describe the rules to you in three sentences or four, it becomes a water cooler conversation and people start to think about what's going to happen when this occurs, not whether it'll occur. Um, I love this. We talk, about, we, we talk about this all the time with our clients but it's a lot harder than it seems. And there is this other aspect, right, subjective criteria that I'll talk to about. Um, and I can kind of be a little more specific on the subjective criteria. This is probably more art, and this is probably more science. Um, but on subjective criteria, the other analogy I like to use is that, you know, if you're in the Olympics and you're the American ice skater and you get stuck with the French and the German and the Russian judge, you're kind of in trouble, right? Th that, that's kind of how that works. And so wh where there is subjective criteria, what we try to do is we try to ensure that there's a fairly rigorous process and that everybody gets treated fairly. And how do we do that? Well, the first thing we do is we come up with trait rubric scoring models, right? So if you have a person judging you, right, they're going to be judging you on multiple criteria, right, or multiple traits. And one of them may be innovation. This is actually a cut from one of the um, prizes that we ran where you actually define what's ordinary, what's inspirational, and very quickly, the judge is able to kind of use this tool to, to rate on one trait. And you might have three, four, five traits per review. 
But in addition to having multiple traits per reviewer, we also need to have multiple reviews per entry, right? This gets to statistic normalization, right? This is where if I get stuck with the hard judges and Sid gets stuck with the easy judges, we get treated roughly the same. And it's very simple, and those of you already know about it, you basically drop the lowest score to a zero, raise the other one to a 10, and kind of push out the band of review so that everyone's getting fair treatment. These things intuitively sound, hey, that's fair, that's good, that, that works. When you try to kind of create a prize where you're operating under those assumptions, it becomes very difficult. So when people talk about subjective prizes, they eventually land at this formula, of which there are four variable parts. Submissions, normalization, bandwidth, and judging. So we all agree that if you have an open prize and you can attract as many quality participation and as much quantity and quality as possible, that's good for us, right? But this becomes very problematic very quickly, right? Let's say we get 20 proposals. Let's stand pat on five reviews per proposal. You've got 100 reviews, right? Let's say it takes an hour to review each one and you only have 10 judges. You're asking for 10 hours from each judge. This math starts to get really clunky as soon as you get into kind of raising or lowering the bar according to how you move these variables, right? Again, 20 proposals, five reviews. Let's say it takes three hours to review one. I mean, to review a business plan, right? Is that gonna take you an hour on average? It could take you a lot more than that, right? And, 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 and what happens is a lot of times when people start looking at this math, they start moving the levers, right? And the first lever that they tend to turn here is fairness, right? The lower the number of reviews per entry, usually there's somebody min in middle management that's looking at these things as they come in and saying, this isn't worth my judge's time, this isn't worth my judge's time. And so eventually, from the participant's point of view, the feedback diminishes, the, the value of participation diminishes, and where people are trying to repeat this year in and year out, all of a sudden in the first year when you've launched and, you've not, and it's not fair, it's not open, it's not transparent, you start to lose. People start to tell their friends, don't, don't play in this, and it becomes very, very problematic. <laughs> so now let's multiply that problem, right? 100 proposals. All of a sudden you've got, again, standing pat at five, three hours, you're asking a lot from each judge. And then finally, this is the more likely number where you have a completely open process, 200. It just becomes unmanageable. Unless you anticipate these problems, unless you create a process in which there is feedback and there is transparency. So this is kind of, uh, I welcome all you guys. I think the slides are available. You know, play around with this formula as much as you want. This is what you eventually need to land on when you're designing a prize that has subjective criteria. This is a campaign uh, progression uh, pattern. This is, this is really kind of what happens when you run one of these things. People don't do their homework till the last minute. We know that, right? But what do we do when you're not sure if you're going to get 300 or 200 or 10 entries, and yet you have to down-select from that in a way that's fair, right? This is about a four-month process. This is about a 10-week process. So if you're the guy that participates here, you're not going to hear anything until probably here, right? It's not a very positive experience unless you can allow them to connect to the other players, unless you can give them something to do while you're going through this process of down selection. The, the, our solution to some of these problems is really to create this multi-tiered structure. Internal screening, selection committee, jury. You know, the, the column tends to look like an 80-20 split, where 80% is usually stuff that doesn't really require the attention of your best experts, 20 does. So there, th there is a way in which you can kind of treat different levels of quality differently. And we, by and large, rely on software to do that. We try to automate that process. We try to let people know that when they've been reviewed by someone who's more credible or less credible, it's because here's where they are in these stages and gates. Um, I want to bring this up because this is a client that had a $10 million media budget. It really underscores a point that I previously made where we were dropping in these major buys, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, full page ads. This is a, a measure of quality participation. The needle didn't move at all, right? So you get to $10 million, wasted money, wasted money. Then you get to our approach, our Tiger Team approach. This is where you've got a very lightweight website and a nomination form, and you've got a team of five people that are reaching out into these concentric circles of experts, and they're saying, you know, Yet Ming Chang at MIT, where are all your postdocs that are focusing on energy storage solutions? Where are they? He's telling you, you're reaching out to them, you're having them nominate other people. This is what works. This is a dashboard approach to kind of how we measure our progress. This is 
a success story for us. This is conversion from nominations to submissions to quality submissions. This is what we look at. We're calibrating this. Think of how we run this as similar to how a political campaign is run. Very similar. Um, this is what we deliver for our clients. So I, I think at this point, we only have a couple more slides, a few more slides. Um, you know, our process, this is where I'm kind of putting on my sales hat. Our process is really, once we've determined what the goals and the objectives of the client are, we build a workflow diagram, right? And this is a typical one um, in which we're trying to create these stages and gates so that each one can kind of be addressed sep separately or we can carve them out and talk about whether it's software, whether it's manpower, how we solve for these things. This is followed by, you know, breaking down a particular stage in the process and creating the supporting documentation that kind of affirms some of these assumptions or that kind of gives substance to the process. And then lastly, this is my last slide. So, you know, when we were at MIT, I, I went back there last year and um, I gave a lecture and, you know, the great thing about MIT is that you walk through the halls and they have all these prizes everywhere. It's like Lego challenge over here, business plan writing competition over here. It's just, it's, it's all about prizes there. And I pulled this one off the board and I took a picture of it because I think for me it captures kind of the three really elements of what people want in these prizes. They want competition, they want to compete against others, they want to know how good they are, you know, they, 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 they want to know how much mastery they truly have. They want feedback from experts, they want people who are credible in their eyes telling them how good they are, and they want money. They do want money, and that's a big part of this too. So that's the end of my presentation, and I answer any questions here or there. Thank you.